A number of people have asked me about the subject of baptism, and I realized I'd not preached on it for a while, but also it's a really great subject to encourage all of us. And what I'd like to do today is to explain baptism and to encourage and empower all of us as we get hold of its true meaning. Because when we understand its meaning, it's actually relevant to all of us in our lives, even if we were baptized long ago. So what is baptism about? In a nutshell, it's about being united with Jesus in his death and then in his resurrection. And I'm going to uh, have three things today. First of all, I want to talk about going down, join to Jesus in his death, and then coming up again, join to Jesus in his resurrection, and then, so why get wet? That's our outline today. <laughs> so first of all, we're going to look at what the Bible teaches about this. And there are three places where it's taught in some detail, Ephesians 2, Colossians 2, and Romans 6. We're going to look at Romans 6 this morning, which is the fullest explanation. And so reading, starting to read at verse 3, and I've highlighted everything relevant in here to our topic, as you can see, there's a lot in there. Or do you not know that as many as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too may live a new life. So that's pretty clear what the imagery is there. Verse 5 for if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, we will certainly also be united in the likeness of his resurrection. So he went down into the grave with the old body, and what he came up, it was a new creation body. And here we have the image of the new life coming up out of the water of baptism. Verse 6, we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin would no longer dominate us, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Well, that's an interesting idea. We're going to talk about that in a minute. For someone who's died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ we believe that we also will also live with him. We know that since Christ has been raised from the dead, he is never going to die again. Death no longer is his master. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. Now the jump, which is kind of surprising, but we're going to see in a minute how he makes this connection. So to you too, consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its desires. He's making a connection here which isn't obvious on the surface, and we're going to look at this because he's talking about sin's control over us somehow being related to this baptism thing. Do not present the members of your body to sin as instruments to be used for unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as those who are alive from the dead, and as the members of your body to God as instruments to be used for righteousness. For sin will not be your master, because you are not under law, but under grace. So you're forgiven if you don't immediately understand everything he's saying, because for 2,000 years, Christians have, have studied these and, and written, poured over these things, and there is so much richness in this that I'm not going to do 
justice to just more than a little bit this morning, but it's just such a, there is so much in there. So first, let's talk about the idea of being united with Jesus. Um, uh, here we have the basic idea, and uh, in some way that we can't really explain, that if we are Christians, we were there on the cross. In some sense, even though it happened 2,000 years ago, there's something in us, in our core identity, that was there on the cross, that actually died with G in Jesus Christ and was raised new. And I don't understand this, and that's okay. I don't think we're going to understand it until heaven, and even then we might not. But it happened, because the Bible tells us, and it is of core importance. And so um, the, the price was paid for our sin, and we, we, we walk free. And uh, so when a, pr when a sin has been paid for, when the punishment has been paid, there's no more price. I have a friend in England who did some very bad stuff when he was growing up. He actually robbed a bank, which he got arrested for. He did time in prison. And when he was freed, he'd done his time. He couldn't be prosecuted for that again. It was done. It was cleared. And the idea here is that, that we've... We, we paid the price on the cross, joined to Jesus, and so we can't be prosecuted for that again. We're clear of it. Um, uh, uh, so this, so this, that was one of the things that happened. The second thing that happened, the first thing that happened was the guilt of sin was taken off. Its guilt was gone. The second thing is the power of sin. This old dark power inside us Makes it, making us a slave to, to doing the wrong thing has been fatally wounded in the cross. And so in the cross, we're free from two things, from the guilt of sin and from the power of sin. There's a lovely old hymn written in 1776, a Rock of Ages. And the end of the first verse says, Be for sin the double cure, Cleanse me from its guilt and power. That's just beautiful. Unfortunately, somebody more recently said, cure doesn't rhyme with power. Let's change it to cure and pure. And, and it may rhyme better, but it's destroyed the theology here. <laughs> so so um, the whole point here is that there are two things that sin has. It gives you guilt, it makes you guilty, and it has power over you. And the cross has done both things. The guilt, we're, pure, we're purified as white as snow, so we don't have to face God's anger. Or we're now restored in relationship with him. The power is strength right now to battle sin and have victory. And when you read through Romans, if you read Romans 5, it's mainly about the guilt and how resurrection frees us from the guilt. Romans 6, which we've been reading, is mainly about the power. And then uh, Romans 7 and 8 kind of bring these two things together. Romans 8 is particularly about the power again. So let's just look at one or two verses here, bearing in mind this idea of guilt and power. So I just want to, to look at verse 6 here. <clears throat> we know that our old self was crucified with him, so the body of sin would no longer dominate us. Is that about guilt or power of sin? Power, yeah. It's like dominating us. It's enslaved us to it to sin. So this is about power, sin having power over us. Um, and then we have verse, verse 7. Someone who's died has been freed from sin. Freeing is about power again. Verse 12 Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you may obey its desires. Guilt or power? Power again. Uh, and verse 14, sin shall not be your master because you're not under law, but under grace. Which is that? Power. So I told you Romans 6 is primarily about power. That's why we've got, we've got these. You know, go back to Romans 5 and it's all about the guilt and about how we're freed from it and we're washed clean and we're pure and reconciled to God. So here's the question then. Why do we constantly sin? 
Why, if we've if been freed from its power in the cross, why do we sin? There, there's a problem here. Um, and this is the answer. Because we are living in the overlap of two ages, the old and the new. When Jesus rose from the dead, the new creation began, and it will continue to eternity. And the, the new humanity. The old started at creation, went right through, and will end when Jesus returns. But right now, we have old creation around us. Our bodies are old creation, but in our hearts, we have the new. We're in the overlap of the two ages. And each of us has a tension, because although we have the new power within us, the old is not already dead. The old is fatally wounded, but won't completely die until Jesus comes again. It's effectively being killed, but it's still struggling, as you may have noticed. And one of the signs that you're a Christian is that you have this warfare. Because if you're not a Christian, you don't have the new, and so you don't have this wrestling within you uh, that's, that's, that's fighting. And so we have this power available to us in the spirit, but we have to walk in it. And uh, this is discussed um, beautifully in Romans 7 and 8. I'll just read you the verses. So I find the law that when I want to do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see a different law in my members warring against the law of my mind, making me captive to the law, the law of sin that's in my members. So this is the old the old. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death, which is what he calls the old, the old habits that we have. For the law of life-giving spirit in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. So our new life is in the Holy Spirit, and we are given the power to win the victory against the old, but it doesn't necessarily automatically happen. You actually have to, to grab hold of the new power and to say no to the old, which is why we, ha we have problems as a Christian. If you didn't have this, we would have no problems and we would all be sinless. But it's because the old is still alive and kicking just about that we have to be, we have this um, struggle, as Paul does here. And if Paul is saying he has a struggle, then, you know, I think we can have permission to have struggles in our own lives. And really, it comes to two identities. Our old identity, which is slave to sin. Our new identity, which is free in the spirit. Which are you going to choose to live out of? Which identity are you going to make a choice to live out of? Because you are not enslaved in the old. You have the freedom in the new. Um, so now we're going to come to the other side of the cross. In baptism... You have a new identity that's come out of the water, um, and so we need to live out of it. So I want to look then at what this actually means, being raised in the new. So the verses that Paul tells us then to do this, to live in this new identity. If we've died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. We know that since Christ has been raised from the dead, he's never going to die again. Death has no longer has any power over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once and for all, but the life he lived, he lived to God. And here's the key verse. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. The idea here is that if you go around with a mindset, you know, I've always done that. I'm just always going to do that because, you know, this is my weakness. You're not going to change. But if you say, no, hang on, I'm a new person. I don't have to do that. Hey, I've got the power of God. God, please help me. You can give me victory. And you live out of that new revelation. You can defeat sin. You can do. And he, so he says, verse 11, this is like a key verse for this for today. Consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is what baptism is. It's considering yourself dead, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. It's a beautiful picture. And so uh, there, these are the two aspects that we have um, of sin that are both future, we're going to spend time in glory, and present, 
we actually have to ha able to have some victory now. Um, so um, there's um, <clears throat> there's then a, a victory that's possible from being joined to Jesus. Now I want to spend a little bit of time about thinking about. I know I've preached that not, not that long ago about being joined to Jesus, but you know it's one of my one of my core sermons. <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna give you another side of it. Um, one of the images of being joined to Jesus I love is the picture of the sheep that he's holding around his neck. You know, in uh, Luke 15, what man of you having a hundred sheep, if he's lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that's lost until he finds it. And when he's found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me, I have found my sheep that was lost. Well, people have painted this through the ages, this picture of Jesus with the lost sheep. And here's an old painting of um, imagining what it was like. My favorite is actually a photograph. And this is a guy, somebody's got a shot of him. He was carrying a, a sheep. I just love this, partly because he looks happy about it, but also the sheep looks happy about it. <laughs> And do you notice how he's got it? He's holding, he's holding its, its uh, um, legs like this really securely. And I just love this because I like to imagine myself here and this is how Jesus is carrying me. And this is like an image of being connected with him. And when he died, he went down into death and he came up again and he's with, I'm with him the whole way. He's taking me down. So when he comes up again, I'm like new like he is. I've got a new body like he does. And so this is my future. Uh, this, this same idea is uh, being joined in this way is in Ephesians and Colossians and the idea of being buried and raised with him, together with him, uh, and this being joined together. Now, when someone was, was crucified, they would write the things that they'd done wrong, you know, he was a murderer, um, he stole, he did this, on a, on, on a, a piece of paper which would be nailed, or, or parchment or whatever, nailed to the, to the cross. And that would be there. Um, do you not remember what they nailed to Jesus above his head? King of the Jews, that's right, and the Pharisees complained about that. But that was what was nailed. But what Paul says is that, all everything that you've done wrong, that you've ever done wrong and will done wrong, is actually nailed to that cross that you died on with Jesus, in Jesus. And so if, if, if the enemy brings an accusation, you can say, paid for, it was paid for, look, look, there's the receipt, there's the evidence, it was paid for. And that, it was nailed there, and that takes all the power away from the enemy's accusations. And so if you feel like any sort of, inner criticism coming up and oh you're useless you're no good you can just say no all those things i've done wrong all those failures they were paid for look go and look on the cross they're there and uh, this is the core message of the gospel when i was uh, when i was um, very young i was well not when i was early 20s i was teaching kids i, I used to teach the uh, young teenagers in in kids kids um kids church and um what I was trying to communicate the gospel to them, and um, my idea back then was it was all about scales of justice. So I made up these scales, and I made two little like platters to put them in, and uh, I I got um, uh, a heavy rock which I labelled your sins, and I put in one of them, and then I got lots of bits of paper written with good works written on and I got the kids to put that in the other side of the scale to see if they could pay for the price of their sin and of course they couldn't and then I had a great big rock which I'd labeled Jesus righteousness and put it in the other side and of course that balanced the sin well that's there's not there's nothing wrong with that but that's not how the bible presents our salvation it's not like a transaction that's just done out there disconnected from Jesus he's paid the price and you can kind of go and collect it no it's actually we are connected with him and we are there and we are actually with him when he's died so it's not that he gives us and takes our guilt and gives it to us we are there and because we're in him the guilt that the punishments poured on him is counted as coming on us and so um, the way that the gospel is presented in the New Testament is much more 
about you died with Christ and you're raised with him, which is a relational kind of thing rather than a transaction. Not that the other one is wrong, but it's, if that's all you have, it's a little bit distorted. Um, so uh, what are the implications of that? Um, I think a part of it is, one of the things is that um, the destiny of this little lamb here is is the same as the death. It's, he's going where the he's going where the shepherd's going. Like he's he's with the shepherd, and our destiny is connected to Jesus. And he's going to spend eternity in glory. We're going to be there because we are inseparably connected with him. And and we've you know, our our guilt and our sin has been paid for in all of that. So then, uh, where are we up to in this? We've looked at going down. We've looked at coming up joined in his resurrection, and now finally, why get wet? So what about baptism? Um, as a church, we've done baptisms in lots of different places. We've done it in bathtubs, we've done it in swimming pools, we've done it um, in, uh, we rented a church that had a, a nice baptistry we could baptize in, and we've done it down at Cherry Beach. Mm -hmm. And in a hot tub, yeah, we've done it in a hot tub, yeah, all kinds of ways. And so, uh, Probably it was more often done out of doors in the early church, though that's not 100%, um, but most of the time. And, um, uh, and we would love to do some baptisms this summer, um, you know, when the weather gets a bit warmer and the water's a bit warmer, but, but we would love to do that. And uh, so what's the point of this? Why, why are people doing this? Does anything magically happen to them in the process? No, nothing magically happens, but uh, I want to just say, there's not, not nothing. There's two extremes in the church. One that says you can't be saved unless you're baptized. You've got to be baptized. If you're not, then you're, you're not going to go to heaven. And uh, so the Catholic Church, for example, would say that. The problem comes with something like, uh, what about the dying thief on the cross? You know, was he baptized? No. Jesus said, I'm going to see you in glory. And so people who believe in that have to find a way out of the dying thief and anybody else who you know, makes a last minute salvation, how does that happen? And so um, I, that's one extreme. The other extreme is, well, you know, baptism, it's good, but you know, it's just a, just a nice little symbol you can do. Um, and just, a, just an empty ritual. But, you know, symbols are important. And uh, I want to say symbols have an importance. Like, I have a wedding ring here. It's just a symbol. Is it important? Yeah, it is. It's important because it's, it, it carries a meaning. It's got its important symbol. Um, <clears throat> but also, I want to say this is the main thing. This is the main thing why I'm not on either extreme of the baptism story. I think that all Christians should be baptized if they possibly can because I believe the Bible promises a blessing connected with it. And uh, so, for example, on um, uh, the, day, the, the, um, the, the day when the Spirit was poured out, Peter gets up and preaches and says, um, believe and be baptized and you will receive the blessing, the, the power of the Holy Spirit. And there are some other times when the Spirit came on people after they were baptized. Now, I believe that that if you're not, if you don't have the spirit, you don't belong to Christ. So all of us have the spirit, but I think there is an extra impartation of the spirit promised when we when we are baptized, not in a magical way, but you know we pray for it. So whenever we do baptisms, I and whoever else is 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 leading, specifically pray for that person to receive an extra impartation of the spirit because it does seem to be biblically connected with it. Um, the other thing is that um, <clears throat> baptism, always in the Bible, it's about immersion in water. It's not about sprinkling a bit of water on you. How does that symbolize dying and being raised again? <laughs> a few drops of water. No, it's like going down into the grave and coming up again. And uh, <clears throat> so I think that's, that's an important part of it. So <clears throat> the, um, just to, to summarize then, baptism is three things. It's a public declaration, you're following Jesus. And uh, I want to say about that, that um, back in, in some countries, in some cultures, uh, if you are 
if you declare that you're a Christian, you, it, could, it could be your death sentence. Um, you know, in some, so for example, um, in some Muslim countries, if you're a Muslim and you become a Christian, that's punishable by death. And uh, that was true in the early church. In many cases, people could be put to death as a result of declaring themselves to be Christians. Um, but Jesus said he's not interested in secret followers. He wants people who can trust him. And so part of what it, baptism is, is going public with being, you're, you're a Christian. And so uh, that's the first thing. Uh, the second question then is, why dunk in water as a sign of committing yourself? Why dunk in water? And I've, I've, uh, I think I've uh, explained that well enough now that it's about the, the image of dying and being raised again. And um, so it's a picture of death and new life. And we talked about the opportunity of receiving more. Uh, so... Just going to read those verses, uh, um, three verses on baptism again, and uh, just to illustrate what I mean by this. Uh, those of all of you who have been baptized into Christ, Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Therefore, we've been buried with him by baptism into death. And then verse 5, we'll certainly be united with him in a res resurrection like his. So, uh, so this is the going down and dying and the being raised up again. Uh, so there's this invisible bond that occurred between us and Jesus, and everything in your past has been rewritten, everything you've done wrong has been erased, wiped out by the cross. And then uh, I... I just, uh, just underlining once more, an opportunity to receive more from God. Um, Jesus promised that there would be a blessing for those who kept his commands, and this is one of his commands. And I believe that the power and presence of Jesus is available to us in a special way through the Spirit in baptism. So there may be some people who are here or who are watching online who are not followers of Jesus. And this is a beautiful uh, image of what it means to follow Jesus. Because this is about having the opportunity of having every bad thing in your past rewritten. Everything you've ever done that you regret is the opportunity for it to be erased. Every mistake or hurt just to be wiped out and reconciliation with God so he sees you as pure and spotless and a new power in your life to live in a new way. And I want to say, if you are baptized, your baptism is preaching this gospel. This is what you're saying when you're baptized. You're saying, look at what Jesus has done. He's taken all of my sin off me and I'm coming up a new person. And uh, I want to encourage you, if you're not a follower of Jesus, just ask him to give you this new life and say, I want to give my life to you and I want to be with you in your death and your resurrection and he will give that freely. You don't have to achieve some level of goodness because that's his job. You just have to trust him and say, Jesus, I just want to follow you. I just want to be yours in this. So... Um, and if you are a Christian, but you've not been baptized or you've not been baptized by, by immersion, then I, we, you know, we would love to, I would love to talk to you about the possibility of doing that at New Life. And we would love to have a celebration at New Life of this. But meanwhile, for all of us, let's just rejoice in this new power that we have. And particularly, if there's one thing I want you to, you to take from this, live out of your new identity. Say to those old habits, I don't have to do you anymore. I'm not in, as a slave to you, sin. I don't have to do that. I can live differently now. I have the power of the Spirit. Live out of the new. Don't live out of the old. Live out of the you that's come up out of the water, that's joined to Jesus. Live out of that and recognize you have the choice to say no to sin. You are not enslaved to it anymore. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you 
that we have victory in your death and in your resurrection. Thank you that you have defeated the power of sin. You defeated the guilt of sin and we can walk in purity, uh, in closeness to you and we can walk in power and victory in our lives. Lord God, we thank you for this. Give each of us grace to live this life of victory now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.